as I, I unpack this, I'll say, how many of you think you should be able to have a tank? And some people will put up their hand. <laughs> and they're not joking. How many of you people think you should not be able to carry, you know, assault rifles? Some people will put their hands up. But it's in, because it's interpretation. Now to see the United States Constitution is evil or scary because these people believe that it allows them to have tanks. And if you ask them why, they'll say, well, because the reason for this is we need to be able to resist the government if they, if they you know, get out of control. And we need tanks today because otherwise we can't oppose them. Now that's their interpretation. I don't project that onto all Americans and say, well, the Constitution is really bad. Islamophobes do that with Quran, with Islamic jurisprudence. They basically take what if a group of people, I like to call Daesh. I don't even want to give them the legitimacy of calling them ISIS. I don't want Islam in there, because it's Daesh, right? This is, this is a group of criminals, and Daesh means what? It, 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 it's, it's a way, because it doesn't translate as ISIS. Yeah, it, it's a group that's it's an insult, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, it, exactly, it's an insult. Yeah. So this group of criminals, does not represent my Islam or the Islam of 99.9% .9 of the Muslims out there. How do you let, you know, according to statistics, they say there's maybe 30,000 members of, of, of Daesh. How do you let 30,000 people define what Islam is for the vast majority of people? That's why I think it's irrational. So it's a phobia. And if I don't know if you can put up the, the little cartoon I had, arachnophobia and Islamophobia, right? It's, Arachnophobia, you know, is a fear of spiders. How many spiders can bite you and kill you? A very tiny percentage. But because of that, people are afraid of every spider. I have a friend who's the toughest guy. He'll do everything. But the moment I say to the spider, he like, ah! said, that's so irrational. That's exactly what the Islamophobes do. When they see a small group of 30,000 out of 1.6 billion people do something evil or vile or or, you know, something contrary to civilization. And then the moment you hear Islam, oh, I'm scared. Right, so that's why it's irrational, it's a phobia. It's also exaggerated, because as I said, it's projecting this one interpretation on everyone else, right? So that's why this is the, be this is the best term to use. You know, some people call me and say, you know, you know what, uh, look at all the reaction to M103. Uh, you know, maybe we should back off. Let's change the term, why? Why do you back off of something when this is dealing with an issue that's there? It's not just a, a anti-Muslim sentiment. It's this view that Islam per se is negative, is evil, right? And we need to challenge that. So don't back off from this. And this reaction to the M103, that scared a lot of people. Because you know what, let's, let's just, don't, don't deal with well, this. A lot of people haven't really paid attention to the term before. And when they heard it, it made them afraid because they hadn't heard it defined. They didn't understand what it really meant. And, and really that was a red period because people would kept saying, let's define the term, let's define it. Why? This motion was a non-binding, it's not a bill. When people, people talk about this being a bill, a law, this wasn't, this is a non-binding resolution to say, do we have a problem? And the resolution didn't even say we have a problem with Islamophobia. The resolution says, let's look at this issue, let's explore, let's see if there is a problem, and if maybe the, the finding might be there's no problem. Right? That's a possibility as well. Or the finding might be, yeah, we have a problem, we need to figure out how to solve this. And that's all this was. But the reaction was, you know what, oppose this. We are, you know, going to introduce Sharia. Canada's is another word. trigger word for non-Muslim people. They think it means something. Horrifying. Exactly. That's you know, that, that's the, that's another big issue when this term is used. All debate, all discussion ceases. When the reason I even got into academics is actually uh, in uh, in 2003. You know, I was heavily involved in community where national security became a big issue after 9/11. But I started seeing Islamophobia in the policy making avenues. I started seeing in society how we were trying to change certain things because of the fear of Islam. Okay, so in in in, uh, in, uh, in Ontario, we had a we had a piece of legislation called the Ontario Arbitrations Act. So arbitration is an alternative dispute resolution. So if I and somebody else have a dispute, if it's a private dispute, 90 90% of private disputes never go to court. Probably, probably just settle.
resolve this between themselves. Or they may go to their friend and say, can you resolve this? Or they may take it to an arbitrator or a mediator. So this act allowed for this. Nobody created an issue about this. People were using this. Christians were using it. Jews were using it. Other communities did. The moment a Muslim group tried to use it, oh my God, Sharia is coming. People are going to be stoning women. People will be chopping hands. None of these are possible. Even if this is your interpretation of Islamic law, it's not possible. It's contrary to the criminal code. But the fear generated in this debate was unbelievable. Right? It was initially, when people opposed this, the Attorney General of Ontario responded saying, you know what, there's nothing wrong with this. People can resolve their disputes however they want. It's a private matter. That was the initial statement that came out. I said, okay, great. This is what you're supposed to say. But because of the Islamophobic reaction, you know, Islam is coming to Canada, Sharia is taking over, the government backed off. And the government actually appointed a former attorney general to investigate this matter. And again, she studied it. She was a woman's rights advocate. And she studied it. She said, no big deal. You know what? We're going to have people who wanted to resolve their disputes using religious principles. We'll do so. She gave this recommendation. At that time, I was retained by Isna, Ikna, and uh, Mass, and various other Muslim groups as a coalition to go meet with the government to discuss this. So I met with the government and said, what do you, what do you guys plan to do about it? They said, well, you know what? They're lawyers, so they understand this is, people can resolve their disputes. Nobody can force somebody to resolve their disputes going to court. You could resolve your disputes. So they said, well, you know what? We're probably going to treat these arbitral decisions the same way we treat a marriage contract or a separation agreement. What do I mean by that? Well, if you have a party that's entered into a separation agreement or a marriage contract, as long as the basic laws of the land are followed, we'll respect it. If you don't respect the laws of the land, we can get it overturned in a court. I said, that's, that's all Muslims want, because Sharia, according to most majority of Muslims, is to abide by the laws of the land. So if you make this ruling, that look, arbitral, this Islamic arbitral decision will be treated the same way as marriage contracts and separation agreements, I can tell my clients this is fine, no problem. And that's what they told me, this was the decision. And then I met with, at the time, John Tory, who was now the, the mayor, but he was the opposition leader. And I asked him, what do you plan to vote on this? He said, you know what, he's a lawyer. I know this is not really an issue, but I have never in my life as a politician received so much hate mail and mail asking me to vote against this resolution from all over the world. His words. This is something, nothing significant, but he was receiving mail from all over Canada, all over the world, saying, don't allow Islam into Canada. As if this, that's what was happening. What did that tell you? That this is so much fear, so much, you know, misunderstanding. And I also met Howard Hampton, who was the NDP leader. He said the same thing. He's also a lawyer, so I never received it. So because of all this opposition, the government now announces on September 11th, 2005, on a Sunday, no more faith-based arbitration. So to me, this was shocking. How do you know that this is nothing serious, okay? And this is allowed by the law, but you're gonna change the rules because you're afraid Muslims are gonna use it. It started getting me to think, wow, there's so much fear of Islam. There's so much Islamophobia and hysteria generated that they're actually changing laws right, to deal with this. And so for me, this was, you know, this is not nothing new. Islam for me is not it's, it's there. The, all the anti-terror laws that we have in place today, they are the result of Islamophobia because they're actually overreactions. Okay? To deal with a, you know, you're not going to hit a fly, you know, with a huge sledgehammer. Right? Because that, that's counterproductive. You're going to make a big hole in the wall. But this anti-terror laws that we have in place, because of Islamophobia, okay? It, uh, it is effectively doing that. You're actually creating bigger problems because when you do this, when you target a community, you marginalize the young people, they're actually going to, uh, when I speak across the country, uh, across North America, young sisters will come to me after and say, well, you say this is not a war in Islam, but then this happens, but then this happens, but then this happens. Tell me a bit about what you experienced in your own life or with and your parents in terms of your experience of Islamophobia, what have you seen in, in your little world? My, my world is, is, is not very little because as a practicing lawyer, for but, but as many years growing up, like you grew up in Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, yes, as you were a kid or your parents' experience, 
What did they experience? I didn't. When I was in when I was growing up, I didn't have any experience with Islamophobia. I had experience of racism, being called a Paki, you know, these kind of things. But after you know the the, the, the whole Islamic revolution in Iran, and then the the the, the, the death penalty, the, the death sentence that was issued by Abdullah Khomeini on Salman Rushdie, uh, you know. Then it started, this whole fear of Islam started. And then of course, after the Cold War, you needed the, the Greek menace, you needed another threat. And then for, uh, in the war in terror, you needed this. So after that, I, I started noticing things that were happening to even myself, until for instance, they find out that I'm a lawyer, okay? Things would happen, and then they would realize, oh my God, I can't mess with him because he's gonna sue me, but why do you need to be a lawyer to be treated with a certain level of respect, right? So, if I, I give one example with my father, for instance. My father, right, in, in 2003, he was actually traveling to the United States, okay? Pure Islamophobia that happened. Why? Because here you have somebody who's considered a modern imam. He asked me, should I, I'm I invited to speak in the United States about terrorism and not being Islamic. Should I go? I said, yeah, why not? You're a modern imam, right? Go ahead. He gets on a flight. He's supposed to go to, uh, you know, Orlando. But the flight is diverted. And he's taken off the flight in Fort Lauderdale, interrogated, questioned, made to disappear. He was supposed to uh, arrive there for the, to, to give a lecture. The people called me or called my mother and said, he never arrived. So what are you talking about? I know I dropped him off. So I asked him to go to the counter to ask where he is. And they, they told him that he, he never got on the flight. There's no such people on the flight, him and his assistant. Okay, so why did they interview, why did they divert him? Because he had a business card of a Muslim organization in his, uh, on him. And this organization was suspected. And this is a legitimate organization. There's nothing to suspect. It's, a, it's an organization that has conferences, right? And this is, this, of course, was Islamophobia. It was a fear, reaction. And then he was told he could either stay there for 30 days in jail and appear in front of a judge, or he could go back to Canada by signing something saying he's a member of a suspected organization. Right? So this is Islam, clear Islamophobia. He came back to Canada. The first thing he landed, he says to me, you're a loser. I said, why? He said, I paid for your legal education. You told me I could go and now. I, you know, I said, well, I don't know they're going to act like this. Right? So there's instances, numerous instances that have happened to people because of Islamophobia. It happens to youngsters in Islam. Yeah, in what way? I'm curious about that. We've got you know, some young people in the room. I wonder, or mothers and fathers in the room. Tell me a bit about what's the experience. Psychologists will tell you now this is a big problem with, with students going to school. Just, you know, the, the, the instances. So in Toronto, oops, oops in, 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 uh, it, just outside of Toronto, in Mississauga, you have people who were using a place for prayer. Okay, innocuous. It's an empty room that was being made available for students okay, to pray on a Friday. Not officially from the school, no official school position, just like the kids were going to leave the school to go pray outside, well, there's a room available, let them pray. It created a huge outcry. Why? Because Islamophobia. This was a fear. What is going to be preached there? What is going to be lectured there? Why are they preaching Islam? So these students are not feeling targeted because of their religion. Right? You have principals, you have teachers, and CCM has reported numerous instances across the country where teachers are making statements. Right? Which then single out of a, 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 a Muslim student. Now, why do you want to alienate a marginalized student who could now be a potential if if you say to me, well, who cares? Every group went through this. And every group has been targeted, okay? The problem is, well, it's not fair. You say, well, too bad. Other communities might do this. Well, it's contrary to our constitution. You might say, who cares? Well, let me make it more, a little more selfish. When you drive away and marginalize these young people, they're the perfect type of people to be recruited by extremists out there. Because they'll say, that, that's a serious suggestion, what makes you think that? Because that's what happens. People will, will, youngsters who are driven away, who don't feel like accepted in Canadian society as a Muslim, 
Uh, if you're not accepted, this is what the recruiters will tell you. Look, there is every single Muslim. Okay? When, when that happened to my father, when that happened to Cat Stevens, who was a singer, people would say, look, see, they don't care what kind of Muslim you are. They're after every single Muslim. I travel North America, so you know, this is not really intentional. You know, the anti-terror act, you know, they're not really intentional, but it's having negative effect. They'll come to you then. How can you say it's not intentional? They're actually targeting Muslims. So these are prime targets for recruiting. And these recruiting is not happening in mosques. This recruiting is happening online, where you have charismatic speakers basically saying, look, you have a grievance, whether it's a foreign affairs grievance or a domestic grievance, okay? And like the doctor, Dr. Khan said, all of, there's numerous studies, including one done of 2,200 ex-terrorists by the United States Institute for Peace. And they concluded that the vast majority of them had very limited understanding of Islam, but they did have a good grab of grievances. Muslims are being subjected to this. Muslims are being treated differently. Muslims are being discriminated against. That resonates with them. You tie that with a political agenda, now you create a terrorist, right? So religious, uh, accepting other Canadian Muslims as part of Canada is actually your best counter-terrorism strategy. That's your best counter-terrorism strategy because you say, look, you're accepted here. You can be a Muslim and you can be Canadian. So I can proudly speak about that. But, but not to diminish the impact and the presence of Islamophobia, but the other, the newcomer in this country and in many other countries has always been persecuted. Uh, Chinese and Japanese Canadians were at one time the yellow peril. Uh, Ukrainian Canadians were enemy aliens during the First World War. Uh, no dogs or Irish need apply. The, the newcomer is always the outsider and hated by the dominant society. What, what do we do? Do we just have to wait? No one would say that about the Irish now or about Ukrainians or Japanese Canadians or Chinese Canadians. It, is it just time that's going to help to change this? Well, thank God the level of Islamophobia has not reached what happened to the Japanese, what happened to the Jews, you know, it's, but we don't want it to go there. Because once we went through that stage, then we apologize, we said we did wrong, and we, we did all these mistakes, right? So we don't want this to repeat again, because we are, at, at, you know, the human rights standards today, because of what people went through, have been elevated. We as a democracy have said, look, these are important values to preserve our core essence. And so, now, you know, I actually, the, the first job I got, the interview I went to, was with a big, uh, a, a big Jewish law firm, which actually represented the state of Israel. So when I went into the, the room, it was a big thing, the state of Israel, why are they interviewing me? <laughs> right? Because I had been a very big critic of, of the Israeli government, the Israeli government uh, practices at the time. So they interviewed me, and after the interview, he, the, the gentleman interviewed me, he says, you know, you're gonna find it very hard in this profession. So I'm like, this guy wanna hire me, or he's trying to discourage me. He said, when I graduated, they used signs on doors, like you said, no dogs, no blacks, and no Jews. And they said, today, look, look at us. He himself was Jewish, so look at us. So, okay, and you're, you're, he said to me, you're Muslim, you're Indian, you're gonna find it very hard. I left the interview and I'm like, I don't think this guy's gonna hire me. I went and got a second call back, and they hired me. So I asked the people who hired me, who made this decision to hire me? He says, that guy who interviewed me. Said, wow. So he was trying to tell me that you have to work hard. And I later I developed a relationship with him. But he, when he, was, he was telling me, like you said, yeah, people have gone through this, but don't give up. We have institutions in place here. We have our structure in place to fight back to use the system to educate people, right? We want to say, look, do we believe in the Charter of Rights and Freedom? Do we believe in religious freedom? Do we believe that people should be respected and tolerated and accepted? If that's what you want, then you have to fight for it. So who has to fight for it? We as Muslims have to fight for it, but also non-Muslims have to participate in this fight to make sure that the values that we say we stand for are, are upheld, right? So, no, we don't have to just necessarily sit back and wait. We have to do our part which is taking legal challenges. But legal, taking laws and legal challenges really was limited. The most important thing is education, right? Be educating the Muslim community about their own practices, but also Muslims educating non-Muslims 
about what Islam is, and, and you know, addressing the, the skewed coverage in the media, right? And it's also about engaging in dialogue. And I, we talked about this with the, with the minister when 9/11 happened. After 9/11, the evidence of 9/11 happened. We were trying to figure out at that time I was part of uh, CARE at the time, not known as NCCM. But what do we do? Let's do some, uh, you know, open houses. Let's invite all the local Muslim, uh, non-Muslims into the mosque. And that mosque was a Jami mosque, which is one of the earliest mosques in, in, in Canada from '69. And this was 2001. How many years that? We invited the people, the neighbors, and they said, "We asked, what do you guys think?" They were like, "This is the first time." In their life, they've been inside that mosque. So we were failing as a community because the only other interaction we had with them was when we were parking illegally and they were getting upset with us. Right? And now they've come inside our mosques and then they say, well, this is exactly what happens in a, ch in a church. We're not that different. So, in what way then do Muslims, individual Muslims, and the Muslim communities in Canada have to change? Is there some way that people here today need to behave differently somehow in order to become more well understood? Well, this is a, this is a great step of having non-Muslims come into the mosque and hear this. Muslims have to go to churches and synagogues and temples. Okay, that exchange has to happen to say, look, we're not that different. At the end of the day, we have similar worries, fears, struggles. Right? That's one, one thing that has happened. For Muslims, I also think the day has come now where we need to actually be very proud and openly uh, calm, you know, wear our Islam on our sleeves. Okay, for the longest time people have been saying, you know, keep your religion private. But unfortunately, Daesh has been wearing, you know, has hijacked Islam and is saying this is, this is Islam. So we need to say, look, I'm a lawyer, I'm a professor, I'm a doctor, I'm your doctor, I'm your engineer, I'm your whatever, and I'm Muslim. I'm not that different from you. We need to really do that. It's, it's, it's simple to say. It's, it seems like what's common, it's obvious, but not too many of us are doing this. But so is there a different issue for female Muslims, particularly those who wear the hijab? You're not, I mean, someone would look at you walking down the street and say, guy, cool glasses, nice jacket. But if, you, if a woman wearing a hijab walks down the street, uh, you might find somebody yelling at a car window, go home, go back where you came from. Yeah, that, that, so they're in the front lines. So, you know, for them, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough decision because in some places it might be dangerous. And, and some scholars have said maybe it's dangerous for you to be open, you know, with a hijab. I don't want to, I, I can't give an opinion on that, but, you know, there, there's different views on that then, to say, look, maybe a Muslim woman is in a, in a position where they're bigger targets, not only on the streets, but even for jobs. You know, they may not get the job because they, they'll, they'll tell you, take it off. I've, had, I've handled cases where even a Muslim person who's a hiring person of a firm has told the woman who came to interview, and said, you know what, you probably want to lose that if you want to get a job, right? Now he's trying to protect her. Of course, it's illegal to say that, but he was trying to say, look, you probably have a better chance. But do we really want to live in a society, okay, that is no different than the society we criticize? In Saudi Arabia, they target women because they don't cover up. And in some secular societies now, they want you uncovered. So women are being used by the secular fanatics and by the religious fanatics. Do we want to live in a society like that, or do we want to live in a society that's, you know, we're not going to dictate what you wear within reason? I want to ask you a question about that. Uh, a few weeks ago in the Winnipeg Free Press, uh, editorial appeared from a retired former provincial court judge, a fellow named Brian Giesbrecht, and he declared in this that he's an Islamophobe. And he pointed to strict Islamic practices and intolerance in Saudi Arabia and in Pakistan specifically as his reason. And he acknowledged that in earlier times, uh, Christians and Jews were deeply intolerant too, a long time ago, he said. But they changed, and now they ignore the strictness of the scripture that they might have otherwise rely on to support their intolerance. But he insists on his right to criticize intolerance, uh, the intolerance of some Muslims. And as he put it in the editorial, that's why I'm an Islamophobe. So he looks to Saudi Arabia, which you just mentioned, or to Pakistan and says, there, that's 
that's why I'm this on board. Does that seem legitimate to you? No, I think it's dangerous because when you have a judge, you know, you're sitting in a court, yeah. you're sitting as a judge before. Yeah. And so what, you know, he's allowing his prejudice, his hatred, and this is not something surprising to me. I've actually had discussions with judges who thought, for instance, that I'm not a, you know, maybe in, in, in her mind, I didn't come off as a, uh, a fun, fundamental Muslim, maybe I don't practice. So she opens up and she said, do they, in all the Islamic schools, do they teach anti-Semitism? So I said, what? Right? I said, my daughter's in Islamic school. If they taught anti-Semitism, I'll pull her out. Right? Why would you think, assuming that I would be okay with it, that's Islamophobia, right? So for this judge to say, criticize a, a Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, three weeks ago I wrote an article in the Toronto Star criticizing Saudi Arabia. Right? But I'm not an Islamophobe. But, but, but to call it Islamophobia, you might otherwise call it lack of education, some people might call it stupidity, but if, if you don't know that, does that make you an Islamophobe or does it just make you badly ill-informed? Well, some Islamophobes are, are, are badly informed. Other Islamophobes are actually, this is, this, is their, this is what they do, right? And why does he have to go to, to pick, to say that a group of Muslims does this thing? There's Christians, there's a documentary I urge everyone to watch on Netflix it's called Oklahoma City. It talks about the bombing, Oklahoma City bombings. And it talks about how the whole incident starts. In the 1970s or 80s, Ruby Ridge is an incident where these Christians went up the mountain and they wanted to live as pure Christians. And he joined the, or got involved with the Aryan nations. You know, some of them claim to be pure Christians. So am I going to label, you know, I'm, I'm afraid of Christians now. Um, should I be afraid of Christians now? Because these Christians influenced this guy that went and blew, blew up and killed people in Oklahoma City. And they initially blame Muslims as they always do. But he was driven by the fact that he said that American government was persecuting Christians. Right? So if I say now, well, Christians are doing this kind of thing. Christianity is scary, is evil. That's not fair. Even, you know, unfortunately, the media perpetuates this, sometimes unconsciously, subconsciously. Uh, let me give you an example. Two weeks ago in, the, in Toronto, the Toronto Star front page, or in the newspaper they covered, that these two Christians in Bountiful had married 24 women. And I tweeted saying, thank God this guy's not Muslim. <laughs> right? Because imagine if this guy, these two guys were Muslims. But they were openly saying in the article that our Christian teachings teach this, Christianity teaches the Bible teaches this, you know. But I didn't see any headlines saying, Christianity, you know, Christians doing this. None of the headlines said that. But if this was a Muslim who did this, that's the only focus. You will have, I guarantee you have opinion pieces saying, you know, why does Islam encourage it? How come this is just, it's just under the radar? I, I wondered the same thing a few years ago. There was a Hutterite colony here in which the people running the colony were practicing fairly severe corporal punishment with their children. The child care officials of the province got wind of this. Mm -hmm. They went to the colony and they said, you know, you can't do this in Canada with your kids. They took 40 kids out of the community and then they got engaged in a training process with the, the people running the colony to teach them mm -hmm. the concept of the way that we in Canada, in the larger society, believe that children should be treated. Mm -hmm. But I said to myself, if that had been the Muslim community, what would the response have been? Because here we thought, oh, they're Hutterites, they're isolated, they have a bit to learn, uh, they did learn, the ch they got the children back, they changed, mm -hmm. and everything turned out for the best. Yes. And see, Islamophobia, this, this, this fear of Islam translates into, I've had, I've had cases with, with children's age society, for instance, where the, there's a dispute between husband and wife, okay? They go to a counselor, and the counselor is already Islamophobic because he's assuming that, you know what? The, you know, this man is gonna oppress this and use religion, and the family is, of course, gonna side with the man. Even her family is gonna side with the man. This is kind of, because it's a male, Islam is about males. And so I had a case where actually this, the, the, they, they 
they went to the counselor and then they didn't show up to the counselor. So the counselor called CAS. And CAS came. The wife is living with her parents. The husband is living separately. And they have a child. So because of this fight, a child protection concern, so CAS reports, shows up to the woman's house. And the woman is shocked. She's wearing a hijab. She's a master's student. Highly educated, highly articulate. So he walks in and he says, well, you know what? I'm going to put an order against your husband that he can't see until we investigate. So she said, for what? My husband is perfectly fine. I'm perfectly, you know, we have a fight. I'm in my parents' house because we disagree. We're, we're going to try to work out. First of all, I don't even know why you're here. So the, the therapist called. And then he says to her, he says, uh, in your cult, in your religion, the men, don't they dictate stuff? And she, she was shocked because she thought, well, he's assuming that, that she's illiterate, she doesn't know much. So she called the husband again and said, this is what they're saying. Then they showed up to the husband, and the husband got aggressive and said, look, this is crazy. Why are you even involved in this? We, she, she hates my guts, but she's saying I'm okay with the child. Why are you worried about this? This and that's Islamophobia. The fear was that Islam and part of the discussion was that, you know, your family's probably forcing you to go back. She said, no, my family is standing with me. I ended up getting involved and I wrote the supervisor. And I said, this is crazy. Why, why is this person even involved in this? And when I made calls about this person who had, who had the CS person who showed up, there were numerous complaints about this person, how this person had discriminated against the community. He was clearly Islamophobic. He was projecting his extreme, you know, the extreme interpretation of Islam on everyone. Meanwhile, the party had nothing to do with it. And they only backed off because they hired a lawyer. So do you really need to want to live in a society where you have to end up hiring lawyers every time in order to get your rights? Right? Because they're acting on irrational, exaggerated fears. Well, there is a widespread belief in the non-Muslim community that Islam oppresses women, and the hijab is the perfect example of that. So what here, we do here, here's what I say about it. Islam doesn't oppress women. Some Muslims oppress women. Just like in Canada, many Canadian men oppress women. So do you say Canadian law or Christianity? No. Some people will interpret Canadian law, and there's domestic violence is a huge issue. Maybe they don't use the label honor on it, but when a, when a boyfriend or a husband walks in on his wife and kills him, okay, that's domestic violence or assault her. That's domestic violence. And there's thousands of these happening. But do we blame the whole system? And we don't call them honor killings. We don't call them that. Yeah. And we don't blame, we don't, we don't use the monolithic, or you know, Canadian society like this, or Christians are like this. But when Islam is involved, now, Islam is, no, Islam is not a, Islam is subject to interpretation, right? There is the beauty, one of the, one of the ways I actually got interested in studying Islam was I went through phases. I'm, you know, my father was an imam, so I'm a son of an imam. It's not meant as a derogatory thing, but you know, I'm a son of an imam. <laughs> and, and when I was growing up, in, 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 in high school and other, you know, I would be Muslim in front of my parents, and I'd be like, you know, average Canadian in school. I kept it a very secret. My father was an imam, but I never told anyone. Nothing to Islamophobia at the time. He never told me. I never told anybody that he was an imam. I used to, I used to say he was a director. So something, the director, movie director? I didn't direct that. 